Hi, I'm Christopher Warnock of Renaissance Astrology, and today I'm going to talk about what I call the module approach to Picatrix. So um, this is what I would say is a potential approach to Picatrix. It's essentially, I've kind of unconsciously come to it, but I, I recognize it now what, what I'm doing, and I want to kind of make it, I like clarity, I want to make it clear to people. And I think it's very useful. What I like about it is this is a way of staying within the tradition, yet actually being able to make talismans. So we don't have to like make up stuff on our own, yet we don't have these absolutely impossible uh, situations. It's interesting, I have students that will go to these particular social media websites and they'll put their elections up and every single one gets shot down. And no matter what you put up there, someone can always come along and shoot it down and say, oh, well, this or that or whatever. Um, so, okay, what do you, well, how, do you, how do you handle that? What do you, how, what's your approach? So as always, I'm gonna be talking about metastructures. This is my sort of way I organize things, organize my thinking, and sort of understand the levels that we go through, um, you know, in our thinking. A lot of this is unconscious, but it's very important. Um, and again, obviously I like my approach, but I like vanilla ice cream too. And people say, oh no, but there's some ice cream really is bad. I'm like, well, you're really kind of missing my point. It's like recognizing that what we're doing is very preferential. There's very little solid objective, you know, basis to, you know, one choice over the other. Um, it, you know, really it's very helpful. It undermines the ego. It allows for the possibility of different approaches and it allows for clarity about our own approach. So if we're locked into this idea that my way is the only way it's possible, then we're absolutely, you know, we're not gonna be able to change our, our methods very easily. So the other thing I've noticed is that if you have influence A plus influence B plus influence C, it equals method D. I mean, a lot of the way that people do stuff, people repeatedly come to me and say the same things over and over again. That's because they're basically under the influence of similar factors or whatever they're kind of out in the environment. So again, very useful to see what's going on as opposed to thinking, well, I came up with this. It's like, no, you're actually under the control of certain factors and I'm the same way. I mean, exactly. I mean, I can look at it and say, these are the factors that are influencing me. This is my personality. This is the stuff I've looked at and this is why I'm following this approach. So, you know, these meta structures are very often unconscious. I mean, the most basic is going to be worldview, which is your basic assumptions your, uh, about the, the, the nature of reality. In fact, you know, that is your reality. The standard, as I always say, the standard modern worldview is atheistic materialism. What that view holds is that nothing exists except matter and energy. And th those are interchangeable, equal, equal MC squared. So there's nothing really spiritual. I mean, if you say spiritual, it just means psychological, and psychological means brain function, and brain function is just electrochemical, and that can be reduced to uh, you know, molecules and then, you know, atomic particles and then some atomic particles. And then, I don't know, I guess further as we, science figures it out, there'll be further particles. It's all just basically these things bumping together, doing their, doing their thing in, in material ways. Um, so it's kind of, there's nothing wrong with that as a worldview. It is a bit of an odd worldview. And it's not very practical or logical if you're doing a spiritual science or art like astrology and magic to have an underlying view that there's no such thing as a spiritual. So How's astrology and magic going to operate then? Because um, there certainly is no scientific evidence for a materialistic or energetic cause for astrology and magic. So, um, another thing that flows out of atheist materialism is this view that there is an independent objective reality out there. It's true for everyone, it can be verified, it always works. Um, what I would say about that is that that's an interesting theory. We have no direct evidence of that. I mean, we're only in touch with our own mind you know, with, with consciousness. And so, you know, for example, if you see something, you know, even scientifically, the process is that, you know, the light rays are hitting your retina and then they're translated as chemical and electrical impulses to the brain and then they're perceived. So that perception is not of the thing itself, but of a, an abstraction of it. And it's only, it's everything we experience is really mental. Um, so if there is an independent objective reality, we, there's no way we're going to be able to determine that. Um, but anyhow, that view is out there. Um, I mean, it's not, I'm going to say it's not saying it's invalid. It's a preference. Um, but it is, um, with that view out there, that conditions, you know, how we look at things, what methods we use. Um, and, um, I mean, the flip side of that is to say, well, if there's an objective reality, then it's, it's completely subjective. And whatever anyone says is, you know, I, I think that, you know, gravity makes things fall up. And, you know, and I think there's, we, the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the sun orbits the earth or whatever. I mean, you can make up all sorts of stuff and then that's equally true. It's like, again, that's not true either. There's, there's a middle path between one truth and every single thing that anyone thinks is correct. Um, and so that's a little complicated to figure out.
Um, my view would be that there's multiple interpenetrating realities and that essentially what we're needing to find is the one that resonates for you and therefore that's, you know, that's, that's the appropriate reality that and really that you're a manifestation of. Um, so, um, but one of the outgrowths of this view that there's one objective reality is what I would call a textbook approach. So the textbook approach, when you get a textbook, it doesn't include alternative viewpoints. It's like, this is, this is speaking, you know, this is the truth. I mean, they got together, they got the editors and whatever authors together, and they decided to look at all the things, and they're telling you what the truth is. And that's why it's used for like, it's funny because I, I was very interested in history. In fact, that was my undergrad, uh, you know, what I studied as an undergraduate. And when I was in high school, I took AP American history. And I remember my, my teacher, this was, you know, near a college town. My teacher actually had a PhD. And so what she said in the first class, she said, okay, we're going to look at these various books. There's not, no, there's no textbooks in this course. We're going to look at these various books by these various authors on historical subjects. And we're going to consider the perspective and the, the bias and views of each individual author. And then we're going to try to, you know, we're going to think about those. We're not going to try to say what the one truth is, but we're going to try to look at it from these alternate perspectives. That really blew my mind. And so that's kind of, again, the approach I would have is to say, well, instead of being one true reality, you've got a variety of these different perspectives and we can look at the, and they're useful for different purposes. So if you take Picatrix, which is our key grimoire of astrological magic, it's our main source. It was certainly the main source for medieval Renaissance mages like Ficino and Agrippa, Lily, they all had copies of it. If we take it as a textbook, then there's a tendency to say, okay, to think that there's a unitary voice here, that somebody went through this and everything fits together, everything works, and it's telling the truth and it's used for everything. So we have to follow everything Picatrix says because, you know, it's a textbook. Um, and it's that, I, I, you know, I hear that a lot. And so the problem with that is that Picatrix does not speak with a unitary voice. It's, it was written in about 1000 AD. I mean, they didn't have the same style that we use. And in a more traditional sense, what they would typically do is it's a compilation. They would compile the previous sources. They might make some comment on it, but they didn't try to, to, to synthesize everything. They didn't try to make everything fit, and they didn't necessarily try to figure out what the one truth was about every single issue that's raised in it. So, you know, Picatrix will say X, and then it'll say something completely con contradicting another section. So if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to take Picatrix as being the absolute truth, you know, straight gospel, you're going to get very confused because there's all sorts of different contradictory passages. And as a practical matter, you can't, you can't apply everything at once. So I think that that's a problem. And so what tends to happen with that is if you've got this view that, okay, Picatrix says X, you have to ignore a lot of other stuff. That kind of not, all the not X statements you're going to have to not pay any attention to and pretend that they don't exist because that doesn't fit with your view of Picatrix. Um, so I think that, like I said, so the, like I said, they've got some heuristics and psychological factors in here as well. Is that so? Part of it is that you know what we want to do is we want to, if you, obviously an election with one factor, well that's all, that's not so great. Two, that's better. Three, four, five. There's no end to it. I mean, more is better. I mean, if you have a 50 factor election, well that's really great. That's the best possible. You know, and you and the other thing would be a fear factor. It's like, oh my God, this is so dangerous. It's so deadly. You know, if we make one mistake, we're going to destroy everything. My head is going to explode. It'll ruin it. You know, and there's just, we can't do that. You know, there's also this like, well, you know, I made this talisman and this, this happened and that must be because of this factor in the chart. So therefore I consider that, that that factor is absolutely super important. And Picatrix says so too. So a little bit, I mean, you, you, it's very difficult to tell your causality with a spiritual thing and you do it once. It's very, it's like I went to New York. And I talked to this person, he was rude, so all New Yorkers are, I don't get ever going to go back to New York because obviously New Yorkers are rude. It's a terrible place to visit. It's like, I don't know if that's enough experience with a New York to really make a, 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 a and at least there it's, it's obvious, the person you're talking to. The spiritual stuff, I made this talisman and three weeks later my mom fell down the stairs. I don't know if there's even a connection at all there. Very difficult to say. So again, that these are all things that are kind of floating around. Um, the biggest, one of the bigger problems with it is, is that, um, as well as, like I said, that the structure of Picatrix itself is not saying that, okay, you have to follow everything at all times. It's compilations of, of, like I said, over 200 different sources. There's a practical reality, which is that if you want to actually make talismans, you need to choose probably maybe four or five factors. Um, you know, otherwise you're going to be waiting 100 years to get an election or you maybe never be able to find one. Um, you can try to find more. I mean, we have some house-based talismans. It's like a, a, a wealth and success talisman. 
um, Picatrix calls for, I think, 15 factors, and I've been able to do maybe 10, 11. That's absolutely amazing to get that many factors. Um, and so, so what I would say, I, call, I talk about my style is kind of what I call the laissez-faire school. Like I said, there's four to five factors. The OCD school is saying, look, you got to have lots and lots of factors. Um, and this tends to come out of, like I said, this idea that, first of all, it, often these are people make intelligence for themselves. And so they are like, fine, I can wait. If it's 50 years, I don't mind waiting for it. So I, like I said, more is better. You know, I'm, I'm not going to settle for anything less than perfection. Um, you know, and again, my devotional practice, what we're trying to do is to basically use the talisman in order to start the relationship. And so the talisman is not the be all and end all here. The talisman is a means to contact the celestial angel or spirit. So, you know, again, for me, plus four, I mean, probably even plus three in a talisman of essential dignity, like triplicity, dignity, it's probably enough to get in contact with it. And then, you know, it isn't necessarily going to mean that, okay, if I have a plus eight talisman, it's like, you know, it's twice as good. It's way more powerful because it's got, what, charge more or something? Again, this is a different underlying view. But with, with my view, it's like you don't need to worry so much about the strength. Um, I mean, it's good to have it, but it's not something, it's, it's sort of a bonus to have these extra strength stuff. So a lot of the stuff floating around, like I said, you can see all these things going into it. But as a very practical matter, you're gonna, there's a very strict practical limit on how many factors you can actually find in an election. So what happens is people, you can't have the 300 factors listed in Picatrix in every single election. So what you're going to have to do is choose. You're going to have to choose to say, these are the ones I'm going to put in and I'm going to ignore everything else. And you can either do that consciously or you can do it unconsciously. And what a lot of people are doing is they're saying, oh, this is very important, blah, 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 and then they're forgetting about everything else. Or they're saying, well, I don't, well, my, I, don't need, I don't need that, without really a logical basis for it. And so that's what I would say is that I prefer to do it consciously, and I prefer to say, okay, re realistically speaking, we can only do, like I said, three, four, five factors. So how are we going to do that in a way that gives us a powerful talisman, yet still is in line with the tradition? So what I've sort of realized that I've adopted is what I call a module methodology. And so Picatrix, like I said, is a compilation of over 200 different sources. And as you read through it, you'll see these sections. And really what they are are, and, and you can, again, this is the way I'm taking them, as these sort of self-contained practice modules. Okay, Each one is coming from one or more traditional sources, but they're grouped together. And they have um, you know, a set of particular factors that they're looking at. They're, they don't have an infinite number of them, but they say, these are the ones you should focus on, these are the ones you should work with, and they're, and they're often very different. But think about it this way. Each of these modules is, is like its own game with its own rules and methods of play. So if you want to play baseball, you play baseball. If you want to play football, you play football. I mean, you use the football rules, you use an actual football, you know, you, you wear the equipment for it. But you can't play football and baseball at the same time and say, oh, these are sports. You know, we can use them all together. It's like, so we hit the football with a bat and you punt it over the shortstop, you know. Hey, that's exactly how I look at it. I mean, Pigatrix is, again, full of these individual modules that I think really need to be taken on their own. Um, and in fact, there are really a ton of them waiting for somebody to come along and master them and use them for talismans. Um, and again, all of them has a limited number of factors and a definite focus to what they're looking at. Um, so let's just, let's just talk about some of these, these modules. The, f the first one I want to talk about is uh, Book 2, Chapter 10. Now, when I got Picatrix and started working with it, I was really drawn to this section because what it does is it lists a whole bunch of planetary images. Now, these are from different sources, but it'll, you know, it says, you know, uh, Belanus or whatever, Apollonius. There's lots of different sources listed for it, but they're all similar because what they're doing is saying, here's planetary images. So these very evocative, poetic images for the, for the planets, you know, uh, an old man seated on a throne with a scythe, you know, or a king seated on a throne with a raven, with a dragon underneath, that's for the sun. Um, and so what they do is they give you an image, and then they list the factors that you would use for the election for the talisman. So um, typically it's going to be planet is dignified by sign or exaltation. The planet rising and culminating makes sense because that's also a very strong position for the, for the planet, and then planetary hour. And so then I've added in that the planet and the moon, but you could say just the planet, are unafflicted. So this comes from general medieval Renaissance practice. I mean, you don't want to make, it doesn't make sense to be maximizing the strength of the election and then have the planet afflicted in some way, a retrograde or combust or applying square to Mars or something like that. And these are very standardized afflictions. And so there what you've got with that module is you've got um, 
three to five factors. There, you can find these in practice. It's actually possible to find talismans. I do it all the time. Um, it's in the tradition because it's following this particular module. And then also, these are very powerful talismans. So, so that's what I'd say. That's a really good example of the module method. Um, and, and I'm, but I'm not importing a lot of other stuff from different parts of Picatrix. I'm not going to do the house stuff. It's like, you know, oh, you have to do the Ascendant. I'm like, this doesn't mention Ascendant in this module. Okay, you don't see that there. Um, and again, the logic of it is the focus there is on having the planet in a position where the planet is very strong. And so, again, if, like I said, if you've got Jupiter talisman, Jupiter culminating, so it's at the midheaven, Jupiter in Pisces, Jupiter hour, Jupiter and the moon unafflicted, that's a very powerful time for Jupiter. And so they say, oh, the ascended, you got to do the ascended. And I'm like, why? I mean, why am I not doing every other house as well? Um, you know, again, there's that logic of, well, you have to do that because, oh, and if I didn't, if you don't do it, I made a talisman and it was bad. It's like, uh -huh. again, the logic there, whether that's true or not, is, is hard to add in. But you're not following a very logical methodology if you're doing it that way. So on the other hand, if you look at the, you know, if you have house-based talismans and, and Picatrix has, you know, different sections on that, again, you do need to look at this, tell you the houses and look at that and you, do, you follow that. Um, uh, the, the recipe that's set out for that. So another another module set of modules I want to talk about are um, the two Picatrix uh, Mansions of the Moon. And so there's a, a listing of, of Mansions of the Moon in Picatrix Book 1, Chapter 4, and then there's also a listing in uh, Picatrix Book 4, Chapter 9. Now Book 4, Chapter 9 is the one that I use most extensively for man mansion talismans, and the reason I use it is because it has a lot of information. So Book, book uh, 4, Chapter 9 lists the 28 mansions of the moon, lists the purposes for which you make the mansion talisman. It lists it, it has an image, very poetic, evocative image, and then it tells you uh, what materials to use for the, for the talisman, um, if you're going to focus on materials, which I, I don't, but that's, you know, it's there in the source. Um, it also tells the incense, and then it tells you the mansion lord. And then it gives you, it says, typically they're saying when the moon is in a particular mansion, but you, there's some of them are saying when the moon is rising or culminating. But that's, I've added that in because, again, that sort of supercharges the power. That's the most powerful time for a planet, including the moon, is either rising or culminating. So what I do for a, a mansion talisman from this book four, chapter nine, is that the moon needs to be in that particular mansion. It also needs to be rising or culminating and unafflicted. And then also I will think about whether it's waxing or waning. And this, this is a situation where the waxing and waning, I think, because the moon is so central, I do take a look at that. I mean, again, you, this is just what I've chosen to do, and you wouldn't have to necessarily. There's a logic saying, well, the source doesn't say that, and you know, it doesn't really matter. Again, that's really up to you how much you're going to use with that stuff. But I, it's logical, I think, in that circumstance. But again, you're dealing with say three or four factors there, um, and so that's that's again the module approach I've taken with that. Now, the book one, chapter four, is interesting because basically that's different types of elections. And it just says, you know, you can do, you know, for for reconciliation or for, you know, hurting people or whatever. I mean, you can take activities within this particular mansion and you can make talismans. And so they often are contradictory to the book four, chapter nine. So people will try to sort of meld those and say, well, you know, I've got an image here for love and I'll use it with a talisman for destruction because they're both the same mansion. I don't think, you know, my view is that you don't necessarily want to combine them that way. Again, other people have decided, well, it does, we don't have anything else, we'll just use it that way. That seems to be the logic behind it. But what's interesting is at the end of book, book one, chapter four, um, there's a listing of uh, digression into another module, as I would say. And it's, it talks about the moon. And it goes on about using the moon in talisman election. So the focus here very much is on the moon. And so then what you do with the moon is you place it in various signs, okay, with the moon rising. And so you can look at like diurnal or nocturnal signs, okay? So for, you know, like a day chart, you have the moon in a diurnal sign rising or in a night chart and a nocturnal sign rising and then shine, signs of short or long ascension because depending on in the northern hemisphere, certain signs, it goes through in less than two hours and some are longer than two hours and then fixed, movable, and common signs and then the various afflictions of the moon. So this is a module that's got, it's very focused on the moon, the rising sign, and then all the different types of signs. And all, it has the, you know, depending on what you want to accomplish, again, if you want to do something that's going to last a long time, you do moon a fixed sign, something happen quickly, moon an immovable sign, things like that. Um, so again, this module has, I don't know, maybe three or four factors, something like that. Um, it's got a definite focus, it has a definite logic to it, and it comes out of the tradition. So if you wanted to say, okay, I'm the, 
you know, the moon and signs guy, you know, or gal or whatever. Um, and then you could definitely, again, this would be a good self-contained module because it's got a significant number of factors, but not so many you couldn't elect. You can make powerful talismans, but they wouldn't be impossible to make, and it would definitely be within the tradition. Um, so, you know, I think there's, in, as we look at Picatrix, there's a lot of these modules in there. There's a lot of these sections that have, like I said, there's a definite focus to each of these. It's not just randomly factors thrown together, but they have a logic to what they're doing. Um, and you can see that logic, and then you can use that, you know, as, as a way of kind of, you know, maybe modifying or working with the, with the, st the strict rules of the recipe. But nevertheless, you've got a, a, something you can actually work with. And like I said, and not depart from the tradition. As opposed, it's like, again, like baseball. You know, you play the rules of baseball. You can understand they make sense in the game. And you don't try to say, oh, that's a sport. So I'm going to meld them with all the football rules and baseball and basketball are all going to use together. This doesn't really make sense. Um, so I guess what I would say about it is that there's a whole tremendous number of these modules there that people could jump in and start using. And, and that's what I would say. Go in, look at the rules, work with them, make 50 talismans and see what happens. And that seems to me to be a much more logical and effective approach than trying to come in and say, oh, well, I'm going to pull this factor out and this factor out, you know, 20 different, 30, 40 different factors from different parts of Picatrix that have no logical relation to each other. They're not self-contained modules and then try to use them willy-nilly. Um, that's sort of like a modern approach. The modern tendency is to look at everything as sort of tinker toys, every technique from every school of astrology. You can just take it apart and mix it together randomly on the spot. Um, so that's what I would say. There's a certain amount of that methodology that's going on with this approach. But I think it's very interesting. The module approach, I think, is very interesting. It's effective. It certainly is the basis of my practice. And there's lots of opportunity for people to go out and, and like I said, set up their own sort of schools, you know, using these different, you know, styles and, and modules and make all sorts of different talismans, yet stay within the tradition. So I hope you find that useful. It's certainly, you know, like I said, the whole metastructural approach is something I'm very interested in. It allows for clarity and allows us to have a recognition that, you know, like I said, there's just because I do it my way doesn't mean that somebody else's methodology is not perfectly valid um, without sort of flipping into the everything is valid no matter what, no matter how crazy it is. Um, so, I, again, like I said, I hope that's useful and I hope this is sort of fruitful for people uh, going off and doing their own, you know, explorations and picatrix as a methodology for, for, for working with talismans.